I'd like to start by expressing my sincere gratitude to Dr. Vinay Chandra, Hari Kiranji, uh, Dr. Nataj Paturiji, and the organizers for giving me this opportunity of sharing what what really is, I would say, a little bit of the fruits of my manthan over the years working with Sanskrit, working with the mantra tradition, the sounds of the Sanskrit language. But before I go into it, I'd just like to start by also invoking uh, the blessings of the gods, as we always do, to ensure that what comes out is true to my knowledge. So, Om Shanno Mitra Shamvarunaha Shanno Bhavatvaryama Shanna Indro Brihaspatihe Shanno Vishnu Rurukramaha Namo Brahmane Namaste Vayo Twameva Pratyaksham Brahmasi Twameva Pratyaksham Brahma Vadishyami Ritam Vadishyami Satyam Vadishyami Tanmamavatu Tad Vaktaram Avatu Avatu Maam Avatu Vaktaram Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. So, like Kadi Ratanji had mentioned in the morning, that uh, we need to be scholar practitioners. I would rather believe that I'm a practitioner scholar. So, <laughs> there is more of practice from my early. Uh, early learnings or my early education in the Sri Aurobindo Ashram School and that was then followed up with a little more scholarship in Sanskrit. Uh, so what I would like to do is also a sharing based on certain inputs that I have received since morning by the various speakers. But I think a lot of that uh, from what uh, Dr. David Frawley said, uh, Raghunanand Narayanji said, uh, Dr. G Ganga Dharanji said and many of them have spoken about, I thought I'll or rather, I see the world around me in terms of this quotation that is there by Tesla. It's attributed to him. I have not yet had the opportunity to check its authenticity, but this is a quotation that's often attributed to him, which says that if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibrations. And this also, in my understanding, uh, ties in with what Dr. Fre uh, David Frawley was saying in the morning, of saying that everything emerges from the sound Om, or sound is at the basis of everything. So I will try and first uh, try and share with you how I understand that, and then link it with the role that Sanskrit plays in really representing this uh, knowledge through the tradition of vibrations and uh, thing, uh, through the knowledge of vibrations and frequencies. So I'll do a small picture. I'll try and see if you can see it from here. So. In the, in the Vedas and all, they talk of the supreme being. First, it was just the being. So there was no movement. It was everything. It was. So there was this sat that existed. Okay. So I'd like to represent that in terms of a point maybe. Or maybe I'll put the point more in the center. Okay. So there was a point in the middle. And then that point said, Ekoham Bahusyam. I have to become many. So the moment it entered into this manyness of existences in terms of again vibrations and frequencies it went into all different directions in this manner okay if you can see it can you see any of that so it's basically radiating out and becoming various things so i would imagine that if you started out initially the vibrations as they would go out would be very simple and then because of the interference and interface of different things, it would start getting more and more and more and more complex. So what was initially a subtle start then became more and more dense in terms of frequencies. And that density then ma became matter. So when we talk of the evolution, the involution and evolution of consciousness, we also understand this process of involution as being a point that then, uh, or rather this consciousness, the subtle uh, energy form that then densified and became gross matter. In the process of becoming matter, it had to lose certain of its characteristics of being energy. So that energy had certain qualities. All of you are familiar with that already. So it was, 
then it became it, it was conscious so that's a very big difference between the energy that science talks about and the energy that the yogic sciences talk about the substratum of everything is a conscious energy and therefore if it is a conscious energy everything that it creates has a certain knowability about it i think that's very important to uh, uh, to recognize that because the source is a conscious source everything that it created had certain truth patterns and in the complexity of those truth patterns as it radiated out there was a loss of information of the original sounds and in that loss of information there were deformations that came about okay so that we can see at all levels so an individual if you have to conceive of an individual in terms of vibrations the individual is a sum total of various kinds and densities of vibrations at a subtle level we have this pure smooth energy so if i have to depict it ah one second so if i have to depict it for you it would it could be like this okay so uh so initially the vibrations that were there were let's say vast because there is no complexity so it's more open so i'm trying to simplify it i'm trying to help you see it probably in a more simplistic manner so the vibratory level was subtle it was more open as it got dense it became more and more so as if this was let's say the the satya level or the ananda level things are more open and then as they get into the manas so if that's from your mind level it starts getting a little more dense until in the physical it's an extremely dense pattern now the question is that our being is it a pattern like this or does it correspond more to these sets of patterns and we see that if we have to look at the kind of patterning vibrational patterning we have we are in an extremely complex web of these patterns and where do these uh, com where does this complexity of the web of patterns begin i would say it's probably more because these two levels are unaffected they are connected with the truth of things but as it enters into the uh, the lower hemisphere as they say in the vedas they talk of two hemispheres there is the upper hemisphere and there is a lower hemisphere as it enters into the lower hemisphere it starts getting into the ajnana or when we talk of ajnana it means that it is developing patterns based on our thinking that it is this rather than knowing what it is as a result of which we enter into this kind of a um, messy noise structure so if we have to look at ourselves if we could flash an inner eye and try and read our vibrational pattern we would not really find it in all harmony the body is in harmony and the emotions are in harmony and the mind is in harmony instead it is all a complex knotted system now the more complex and knotted the system is very simply what kind of breathing would happen in a pattern like this versus a pattern like this we can see that if we have a pattern that is knotted fundamentally knotted the breathing cannot be smooth and long etc whereas if you have a pattern that is more evened out or smoothened out the kind of breathing that takes place is much more regular uh, etc so then the other thing if you have to talk of this in terms of light and darkness a more knotted uh, vibratory pattern corresponds to a lot more darkness within the system versus a more open a uh, free kind of an aligned pattern right and finally uh, if we have to talk in terms of health will this correspond to more health or this one so it's very obvious the this one will correspond to greater health so when we are talking of uh, the what gangadharan ji had also talked he says that the indian world view was this multi dimensional uh understanding of our nature and we were talking of a functional harmony so because we are already in movement these vibrations do exist if these vibrations do exist then what is the state of those vibrations and how can we realign them to en enable us to experience greater degrees of health and well being within us and it's in this context that we see i mean this for me this explains a lot of things that if at the physical level it is all knotted up like this one way of opening it up is by doing hatha yoga so if just by stretching out the system the you start feeling mentally well because at least these knots have opened up a little bit 
So you see how, because it's all a continuum. Uh, because it is a continuum, if this, these knots are opening up, then automatically these knots start feeling, a, breathing a little more. And similarly, if on a bhakti level, so the bhakti normally is a bargaining kind, I mean, uh, the emotional world, not the bhakti, the emotional world is a world of bargains. Uh, so the more these bargains, the more the calculations, the more complex the knotted uh, patterns become in us. So the question is, when we do bhakti, when we engage ourselves in bhakti, there is only a giving, there is no expectation of a return. So this giving of oneself allows the heart spaces to open up. Once the heart spaces open up, again, we experience greater degrees of peace and wellness automatically. And similarly, at a mind level, Jnana Yoga, for that matter, when the mind is all knotted up with thoughts that are unclear, the Vikshipta Manas, when the mind starts becoming, having more clarity, then we see that the mind patterns open up, opens up, and there you have greater clarity in things that we do. So we see that the whole objective of the yogic tradition, no matter what the starting point, is to go from an entirely knotted system to a more systematic, unknotted kind of a framework. I'm talking of all this at a vibratory level. Now, another way in which one can have a very powerful impact on an extremely knotted system is, if I tell you that uh, if there is a battlefield, all right, imagine, and suddenly there's somebody who plays a beautiful flute sound, what will your attention follow? Automatically, irrespective of that noise, your ears will tune in to that beautiful sound of the flute. Now, the role of the mantras is a little bit on those lines. The role of the mantras, in my understanding, is systematized sound technology, where sounds were spontaneously placed in a certain order, which would uh, correspond with the rhythms of the cosmos. So, it had these vast patterns because the source of the sounds was satyam. The formations of those words were not mentally created. They were just mentally perceived, but not mentally con conceived and created. And therefore, the impact of those sounds on our vibratory structures was that of a wide openness. And that's why listening to mantras, one of the, when I'm saying that's why, I also would like to admit that this is one way of looking at it. All right. So this way of looking at it, you see that when you align yourself with the sounds of the cosmos, then the qualities of the cosmos start getting reflected in our chitta. And the qualities of that cosmos are unconditional, not the, the fundamental, the foundational qualities of that. So where does all this tie in with, the, with Sanskrit? Where does all this tie in with the entire Mantra Shastra? And why Sanskrit becomes such an important key in uh, opening up our uh, inner world, not the di new dimensions of our inner world? So what I'd like us to do is, uh, in this understanding that the whole world around us is vibrations, we also need to understand that when we, when I make a particular sound, I create a very specific effect. If I make a particular sound, I can break glass. I change that sound, I no longer break glass. So there is in the physical world a very intimate relationship between a, vibe, a frequency produced and the effect of that on the physical plane. But this also happens at the emotional plane. So if I uh, if I play a certain music, I can feel happy. If I play another music, I feel sad. So sound is cutting through our emotional world as well. Similarly, sound is also cutting through our mental world because if I tell you a certain word, it will evoke a certain image. If I tell you another word, it will evoke another image. And therefore, it is cutting through our mental world as well. So now the question is that when you're making a sound, it is leaving its imprint on all these different dimensions of our being and creating a, a certain desired or undesired effect, whichever way one is exposing ourselves to that sound. So, uh, knowing that in the Mandukya Upanishad, they, they, they talk about the Om. So, in the Mandukya Upanishad, they talk of the four states of consciousness and then they talk of the Om and they break it up. And it is that text that also got me thinking about the practical implications of what is being said. So, I'd like you to do an experiment and I'd like you to do it as freely as you can. All right. So this is a call for you to uh, participate in this, in what I'm going to try and share with you. So what I'd like you to do is to try and relax your being as much as possible. So sit straight, try and relax your being as much as possible. So try and just calm your inner structures. And then I would like you to make the sound 
ah. But I'd like you to make the sound in a lengthy manner. So take a deep breath and do ah. Just one second. When you're doing that sound, I would like you to observe what kind of physical movement spontaneously comes when you do the sound ah. <coughs> So when you're doing the sound R, what do you feel like doing with your body? What do you feel like doing with your hands? Okay. I'd also like you at the same time to observe what does it do to your emotional being? When you're doing an R, what are you really feeling emotionally? We'll do it at these two levels and the rest is understandable. We can work on it. So close, relax as much as you can. Take a deep breath and do the R as freely as you can. So take a deep breath and do it. Uh, so what is the very first thing you observe when you do the sound R? Physically, what kind of action comes to your mind? So what you see, so what is very interesting is so we do this in workshops across the world, and what we see that irrespective of a cultural background, the sound ah naturally corresponds to an opening of the being. And that's why in Sanskrit, when you say ah gachati, it has the sense of coming towards you. Huh? So ah, huh? so it really has the sense of an openness of your being. And in the Mandukya Upanishad, they say, and okay, emotionally, what did it correspond to? So when you open up, then what kind of emotion comes? Calmness. Okay, we'll do one more experiment. Okay, and I'd like you to observe what happens to you. So, close your eyes again. And this time I'd like you to do a visualization. So, imagine that you're standing on top of a mountain. I hope nobody's afraid of heights. But either way, imagine you're st standing in an open space, there's nobody around you. And you're expressing the joy of your existence. So, I'd like you to take a deep breath and do the R ah to express the joy of your existence. Do it. All right. So many of you did not leave the room. <laughs> Even in your head, you were still in the room. Because if you had left the room, you would have seen that the sound, I'm sure many of you were containing your sound. So you see that just a small change. We haven't gone on a mountaintop nowhere. But just a small change in your head, an idea in your head, can suddenly unleash our sound. So the sound, ah, corresponds to the very sound of our absolute existence. And you would see that if you do the sound ah freely, it also spontaneously, what is the emotion that you would feel spontaneously? Two emotions, two things come very spontaneously with the uh, doing of the ah like that. What's, what would they be? Sorry? Self-loving and what else? Expansiveness, joy, power, all these things are embedded in the experience of being. They are not secondary, tertiary kind of after effects. They are embedded in beingness. So our, I mean, it, it's, it's very powerful. So in the Mandukya Upanishad, they say, they say, all right. So in the Mandukya Upanishad, they say uh, that um, one who can recite the A, ah, one who knows how to do the A, ah, will no longer have any desires. So if you just start thinking about how can doing a sound not give you any desires and what they say after that is even more amazing. What they say with the oo, what they say with the mm is amazing. But to think that sounds can give us that experience and if you correlate it, it really is that when you do the sound ah, it fills you with such completeness that there is no need, the purnata, there is no need of anything else. Our unhappinesses all emerge from our uh, limited concept of our existential nature. The moment that gets free, sukha emerges, swasthya emerges, they're all natural, uh, you know, uh, results of just allowing oneself to be. Okay, so very quickly I will wrap it up because I've got a signal to say it's time. But uh, another thing that we observe when we do mantras is that the breath lengthens without our extra effort. That is again positive for the bodily vibratory patterns. So mantras have the power of changing our physiological 
or, or rather the vibratory structures, the fundamental vibratory structures of our nature. That's why probably if one chants the, uh, the Mahamrityunjaya Mantra, it can cure. Now coming to the Sanskrit, and I'm going to wrap it up very soon after that. Why is Sanskrit so important? I have five minutes. So why is Sanskrit so important? So Sanskrit is one language, when we say the Sanskrit alphabet, uh, let me ask this to you before and then I will go into the actual example of it. So if I ask you, uh, how do you make the sound uh, in English, let's say B, so do sound B, there is something, right, uh, the lips coming together with an E and all that. But we don't really think about it. We use language without really thinking of the mechanism underlying the sound production of that. Now, in Sanskrit, it is very, it is laid out in great detail. So when we have the vowels, so I'd like us to do the vowels because uh, this is this is better understood when it is experienced. All right. So if we do the vowels, so ah ah, e e, I'd also like you to exaggerate because this is also a mu muscular movement which has its benefit on the system. So ah ah, e e, u u, r r, l l, a i, o au, um. Ah, so when do we do ah in life? Huh? When you relax. So it's not for nothing that we say speak Sanskrit, your life will be very relaxed. Okay, not always, don't take me fully, very literally. But it is a possible physiological benefit of just speaking the language. Okay, because ah, corresponds to a certain de-stressing movement within the being. Alright, so this is, uh, we have the alphabet now, uh, we've just done the vowels. What we notice is that the Sanskrit alphabet, uh, for reciting the Sanskrit alphabet, it divides the human vocal system into five systematic places of pronunciation. Now that has a certain benefit on our body. So if you speak a language, let's say like English, in English we don't have a soft T, there is no T, nor is there a T, you just have a midway T. If you speak languages like French or Spanish or Italian, there is no T's, it's only the dental T's. What would that imply? That would imply that all these regions of our, that we are touching systematically in our throat have specific areas in the brain that they are stimulating. If you don't have that particular area of touch, you don't actually stimulate physiologically. You would never have stimulated those parts in your brain. Can you imagine the, I mean, we, because we take it for granted, we don't even realize the ahaness of this, this uh, the, 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 you know, the, the language structure that we have. Okay, so when we have the vowels, I mean, when we have the consonants, we have ka, ka, ga, ga, nga. First of all, there is a natural pranayama because you're doing ka, ka, ga, ga, nga. Then you have cha, cha, ja, ja, nya. Then ta, tha, da, dha, na. Ta, tha, da, dha, na. Pa, pa, ba, bha, ma. We follow the order in which sound has come out of the vocal system. All right, and then we do uh, ya, ra. So e is a talu sound, it comes back. So ya, ra, la, va. Okay. All going back. And then we have sha, sha, sa, again, talu, murdha, dantya. So what we are doing just by reciting the Sanskrit alphabet is giving ourselves a brilliant brain massage. I mean, and the benefits of that with our breath. Can you just imagine? All right. Now, another point that is really critical, which is there in Sanskrit and therefore in the Indian languages is the murdha sound. The murdha sound in the Chinese medicine of Ch or the Chinese martial art practice of Qigong, uh, touches the murdha. That murdha in Qigong is the place where you have two, the intersection of your two energy meridians. That's why when people do Tai Chi and all, they are supposed to touch that part and do their Tai Chi. So when you're doing Ta, Tha, Dad, Ashtanga Yoga, if you pronounce it well, half the yoga is done. That's a joke. Okay. So <laughs> I tell my I tell my yoga friends, I said, if, oh, especially the foreign friends, I said, if you can pronounce the asana well, half the work is done. Okay. <laughs> It's half a joker, huh? please. So, um, now the fact is that when we're doing this, like I said, one is we are giving ourselves this brilliant brain massage. Secondly, each of these sounds corresponds to the different chakras of the body. So, the 16 vowels are in the throat, the next 12 are in the anahata, the next uh, 10 are in the manipura, the next 4 are in the swadish, the next 6 are in the swadishthana, and the last 4 are in the mul, and the last, the 4 are in the muladhara, and then ha and ksha, there are 50 letters in the mantra purusha 49 in the sanskrit alphabet 50 with the ksha are in the ajna so when we are reciting the sanskrit alphabet we are actually 
spiraling, literally spiraling down our chakra system. And with the last two, you're woof, you're putting it back into your ajna. So you can imagine that they say that there is a Buddhist practice where they say just recite the Sanskrit alphabet, you'll stay in good health. And there are many people, even uh, somebody like as famous as Pandit Ajay Chakraborty, who suffered a stroke and is completely back normal. He said one of the things that rehabilitated him was his practice of chanting mantras. So what mantras are doing, what Sanskrit is doing, is something phenomenal at a physiological level at least. Right. And therefore for yoga practitioners, I would say, like I said, if you just pronounce things, if you just, and therefore the importance of pronunciation. The pronunciation is not because of some, uh, you know, some cultural necessity, you have to do it. It's not because of a rigidity. It's because of a scientific necessity to get it right. More so, if you have a, if you have something that you want to open and instead of a capital letter, you put a small letter, that window will not open. In this incredibly complex web of sounds, unless you get going to, you are not going to open up different dimensions. So when somebody is playing the violin, even if they are playing it a fraction wrong, you will like it. But when that person plays it right, the, the brihat that happens, this experience of the vast is a whole different experience. And that is what occurs when we do it precisely. And the last point I will make and stop here is that Sanskrit as a language also has the grammatic component of it which is very powerful because Unlike in English, where if I say the boy goes to school, okay, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a left brain function where I'm saying the boy goes to school, the boy goes to school, five words, right? If I told you school, just the word school, you would have no idea what that school is doing in my head. Is it from school, to school? But if I tell you to school, you immediately know what I'm talking about. In Sanskrit, there are no free floating words like that, or very few. Uh, there are very few free floating words. Every noun, every verb is assigned its proper position in your thought. So when we say this sentence, if I have to say, Balakaha vidyalayam gachati. So the moment I say vidyalayam, I have said to school. So if I say vidyalayam, the brain is automatically honed in. You know exactly how it is relating to the subject, whoever the subject is. I say balakaha, you know that it is the subject. Uh, and gachati. We can even reduce that if I say, I go to school, supposing, uh, I am, I go to school, supposing, four words. In Sanskrit, I can just say, Vidyalayam gachami. The ami uh, will tell you that I am going. So, a four-worded sentence becomes two, or a five-worded becomes three. So, you see how the brain uh, is forced to compute. And very interestingly, the frontal cortex, which is actually responsible for the frontal cortex that decide, determines how, uh, the, the state of, or the, the speed of our intelligence and management is one that is also responsible for decision making. And it's just recently that I made this connection and you realize that in Sanskrit, this decision making is a, is a letter to letter phenomenon. Instead of ka, if you say ka, you've lost it. Instead of ka, if you say ka, you've lost it. So this decision is a very, it's, the word French word is exigeant, exig it's very demanding. And that demandingness of the Sanskrit language is what actually helps us become Sanskrita. Because if you have to do a work which has gross things, you develop skill. But now if I tell you, you have to keep uh, putting a needle into a fine bead. The skill set you develop is a very different skill set. So Sanskrit as a language demands us this minute needling all the time. There is no moment when you say, Acha, now I will speak Sanskrit. No matter how much Sanskrit you've done in your life practically, you still have to be alert. And that alertness, that, 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 that thing is what, in a sense, increases the gray matter in our brain, is what I would say. So Sanskrit is a language also because it reflects truth structures. The sounds are true. And that's why it's aksharam, indestructible. It's not been called anything else, nor that its letters are called anything else, because it has the possibility of imprinting us with truth structures. And that's the reason why what I say is that Sanskrit is not just important for yoga, but Sanskrit is a yoga in itself. Just exposure and practice of Sanskrit has the power and the more more uh, 
more we do Sanskrit not as a mechanical tool for something, but you do Sanskrit as a as an instrument of consciousness itself. It has the power of fine tuning our inner being towards truth structures. And if you have many more people who are speaking Sanskrit, we'll have much fewer loose hanging words in the in the thought atmosphere of humanity is what I would say and we'd help up clear the atmosphere in a certain manner okay and the last thing that I would like to uh, put in the in the group here to think about what it implies is that if I have to say in English I say I have a book right in Sanskrit in how would you say it in your mother tongue in Hindi kitab hai Bengali boyache Tamil pustakam irak uh, Telugu Unda, unda, Malayalam, undi, 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 unda. So, you can go across the Indian subcontinent and you will see that we do not have a verb to have in the Indian language, Indian, Indian languages. Now, can you just imagine what that does? What kind of consciousness would have conceived of having, not having had the need to come up with a verb to have? As a civilization, we have invested not in the havings of things. We can be possessors of things. But the thing is always important. The book is with me. The book remains important. I am a trustee of that. But the book remains important. All right. And then, uh, so, but if you say, I have the book, the book's value is gone already. So we as a culture were a trusteehood culture. We were a trusteeship culture. Secondly, our focus was not on havings. Our focus was on beings. Because the investment in beings is a lifetime investment. It's a lifetime investment. Forget lifetime. Lifetime investment. Okay. And therefore, this language, again, I come back to it, has the power of creating structures in our being that transcend many of our, many of our noises, I would say. Just the swabhava of the language. So, kripaya sanskritam pathantu. Uh, kripaya sanskritam vadantu iti mama vinamraha anurodhaha asti. Dhanyavadaha.